Well, okay. Uh, looks like today I'm um, speaking to an, an empty classroom, but uh, I'm, I'm, well, I got up early to give a prepare a lecture for you all. So hopefully we will stay on pace with these things, and we'll see when we come back that uh, everything's kind of back to normal. Hopefully here soon. But anyway, this is a, probably a pretty good lecture to put on record anyway, because we're going to be going through some fairly challenging ideas here that are a little bit, a little bit conceptually uh, difficult to, to wrap our heads around. So it might be good to take it slow and pause along the way um, and see how we get there. But just as a recap for where we left off, so in chapter six, we're going to be dealing with the structure of an atom. Right, and how we can start to put together the bits and pieces of an atom itself. And where we're going to look at is we're going to look at the positioning and the place and the orbitals for where electrons live. And where we were building up, uh, what we had talked about was the idea of what it means to be in the quantum realm. Right, and so uh, if you recall, one of the big important ideas that came out of the first part of this chapter is just what exactly does it mean to be quantized? And we talked about energy, and we talked about wavelengths and frequency, and we learned about the, the science finger and the relationship between wavelengths and energy and all these kind of things. And we got to this idea of what it, is, uh, what it means to be a, a quantum of something, right? And remember, the idea that uh, energy is quantized is going to be extremely important. And what we think about with this is that the energy exists at discrete levels. Okay? And so the first job that we're, we're going to do, or the first thing we're going to start to take a look at here, is just can we calculate the energy of those levels and can we calculate the energy to go between those different steps there? Okay? Now, to get there, what we had come up with is we had briefly discussed about Niels Bohr and what he came up with, the model for the energy levels of the atom itself, okay? And so a couple of important things here. So we're going to see a derivative of this equation here that's going to help us calculate the difference in energy between the different levels of where the electrons are going to be able to live, if we want to think about it like that. And so these energy levels are whole integer values, and that kind of goes along with our idea of existing in a, as a quantized state, right? We can't exist as an energy or at a step that's one half. We're either at one, two, three, four, all the way up to infinity, okay? And so that's what our n is here. And what you're gonna see here on the next slide is that as soon as we talk about transitioning between two energy states, we're going to need an initial energy state, excuse me, we're going to need an initial position, the initial n, and we're going to need a final n, and then we're just going to contrast those two, and then we can get our difference in energy from that, okay? Rydberg's constant is a constant, that's all it is, that's all you guys need to know for that one right there. It's in units of joules, that's important because we are calculating energy here, right? So we better have a unit that is in a... Uh, um, or excuse me, you better have units that are in joules, right? Because this is unitless, so that's where our value of energy comes from there. Important term here, ground state, that is when n equals 1, right? Obviously, it can't be when n equals 0 because then energy would be equal to 0, and that doesn't really make sense, right? Uh, one, or, well, we, it's impossible, right? n equals 0, that's a non-thing, right? We can't divide by 0. Not one of the, you know, not mathematically logical there, right? So um, that's the lowest and the most negative energy. So we got to think about this for just a second, right? I'm going to be bringing this idea back as we finish going through this chapter, but atoms want to be lazy, okay? Well, let me back up for just a second. I should say electrons want to be lazy, and electrons want to go to the ground state, okay? And so the ground state is the lowest energy state. Now, the reason why I'm putting a little bit of emphasis on this is because this is the idea that we're going to come back to again and again. Why do certain bonds form? Why do we see these atoms bond together? Why do we see the strength of certain bonds between uh, certain atoms? Why are they stronger than others? And that's got to all come back to this idea of the ground state and going to the lowest energy state that it can. 
So that's going to be kind of an important idea here, right? Just go to the lowest energy, go to the most negative energy, okay? Um, we're going to talk about uh, this concept here again, I believe in about two chapters or so, one or two chapters. The idea of how can we completely remove an electron from an atom. We're going to talk about ionization energy is what it is. And literally all we're talking about with ionization energy is if we take n to infinity, right? So we have 1 over infinity squared, so 1 over infinity in essence, right? And that just means that it's we completely remove our electron from that particular atom itself, okay? So this equation is going to help us just set up a model for what the, um, for what the atom looks like in terms of the energy level for the individual electrons in there. All right, so what in the world is going on? What in, the, what in the world is going on here on this slide? So if we take our formula, if we take our formula and we solve for n, you know, starting at n equal to one, right? So if you're looking back on the previous slide, if we put n is equal to one, then we have negative rh times one over one squared, which is just equal to rh. That's the lowest energy we can get with this. Okay. If we go n equal to 2, then we get negative one-fourth of Rh, and that's the next lowest energy level. Okay, So each one of these is just a stepwise iteration of n, with this being the lowest, and we go, you know, we go up to infinity, right? Or, you know, up to zero, right? And if, if n is equal to infinity, then energy is equal to zero, right? And what you'll notice is a couple of things here. First, there isn't equal spacing in between these, right? The biggest spacing is between n equal 1, which is our ground state, right? So this is our ground state here on the bottom. Between our ground state and our first n equal to 2, there's going to be our largest space. In fact, that spacing is bigger than any individual other spacings. And it's usually going to be bigger than any difference in spacings that you're not falling back to n equal one. I hope that kind of made sense here. What I'm, what I'm saying is this gap between one and two is significantly larger than most other gaps, even if you're taking multiple steps, okay? So what I kind of mean is if we are stepping between two to four, the step between one to two is still gonna be bigger than that, okay? But that's okay, we'll kind of talk about this, uh, or we'll give an example, and there's a couple examples in the book also that just kind of drive this home. Really, the idea just to think about here is that there's a big gap between the ground state and the first energetic level is what it is, okay? Now, what happens is if we have an electron living at this energy state here, okay, if we add energy into this uh, atom or into this system, or into this electron, okay? If we add energy into here, we have to add enough energy to bump it up to here, okay? And this is what we're talking about with the discrete step, right? We can measure how much energy that is to do that, okay? Or we can calculate it, whatever you want to think about, all right? And we represent that step by just an up arrow here, right? We have to add energy into this to go up. If we're at the ground state, we're at the lowest energy possible, so we have to add energy into that to make it step up at all is what it is, all right? Now, that doesn't mean we have to go directly from one to two and two to three and three to four, right? We don't have to go in that way. We can go from one, right, up to three or one up to four, okay? But we have to stop at those whole integer values. We can't go from one up to one half, right? Or excuse me, from one to one and a half. We have to go from 1 to 2, right, or 1 to 3, or 1 to 4, 1 to 5, et cetera, et cetera. And that works in both directions, okay? When you're going down in energy, when you're emitting energy, okay, you can only fall down to those whole integer values also. So you can go from 2 to 1, or 3 to 1, right, or 4 to 1, or 4 to 2, right, whatever it might be, but you're always going to have to stop at one of these steps along the way, right, at one of these discrete energy levels there. And it's important to recognize that with absorption, we have a change in energy that's greater than zero, okay, we put energy into the system, and we're going to increase uh, n, right, we're going to take a step up, 
right? It's just like um, if I'm drinking some coffee this morning, right? I'm putting energy into me so I can be here and uh, recording, <laughs> recording this lecture for you guys, right? So uh, we have to put energy into the system so that it can go and do what it needs to do, all right? And if we're going in the opposite direction in emission, right, then we're going to fall down in energetic levels, right? So we're going to emit energy for that. And energy gets emitted as a photon, and that's gonna be important in just a second. And so one of the tricky things to think about here is, you know, uh, again, kind of similar to what we were dealing with in chapter five, the energy of a system versus the energy of, a, uh, uh, of the surroundings. So here we're gonna to have to talk about where does that absorbed energy go, right? Or how do we deliver this energy, right? And so that's where we go back to this idea of, quanti uh, of photons or quantization or whatever you wanna think about here, right? I have to shine a certain ray of light onto this uh, atom for it to absorb that wavelength of light, okay? That energy that comes along with this, right? right the energy of that wavelength, right? Here we, we did that little, uh, important, I would say, demonstration with relationship of wavelength and energy, right? If we shine certain light on this, then it's gonna absorb that energy, it's going to step up uh, in different energetic levels. When that's emitted, then light is given off, and that light is given off at individual steps. And that's what we can see here, right? We can measure the energy of the light that's given off with these individual steps. Now, it just so happens that the light we can see with our eyes, the visible spectrum, is when things fall down to n equal two. Now, I don't think we do this lab anymore, but there, there used to be a lab, and I, I believe I mentioned last time, that uh, we burn certain metal salts. And you, could, and, you, and you look at the flame that's given off, and you could actually see the individual lights from that, and you could actually calculate the energy of that emission. Right, as long as we recall that n is equal to two is what we see in the visible spectrum, right? So really cool lab, it's, it's, it's working off of these exact principles and it's basically working off the exact idea we're about to do a practice problem with, right? But it's just, it's fascinating to me that we can calculate the energy of transitions between an, between an atom, right? It's absolutely amazing to me. Um, so if you fall down to n equal two, that's visible spectrum. If you fall down to n equal one, then we're emitting ultraviolet light, right? And if you go back, oops, almost made a mess there and spilled my coffee everywhere. And if you go back to the beginning of this chapter, uh, we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum. And recall that the ultraviolet part of the spectrum is beyond the visible light. So it's at a higher energy. Okay, so uh, I don't, so it's at a higher energy, which makes sense, right? Because we've got a big gap here to fall down. There's a big change in energy between two and one. So we have to push that emission beyond the visible spectrum is what it is. So if we think about this for just a little bit, does it make sense that we are beyond the visible spectrum? If n equal two is where we end up the visible, then uh, um, below that we have to be in the ultraviolet spectrum, right? All right. And we can see up at the top there's infrared there also, the shorter gaps, okay? So down here for the blank for you guys to fill in, n equals one, this is our ground state, okay? And remember each one of these red, uh, these red lines just represent a different energetic level, okay? All right. So real quick, uh, um, let's, let's see if we can take a look at one of these problems here. Uh, a typical problem from this chapter, okay? It says calculate the energy and wavelength, and then I give you a unit here in nanometers for a hydrogen atom with an emission from, or excuse me, with a transition from n equal four to n equal two, all right? And so here's our equation that we're gonna use for that. Now be careful, I gotta pause you guys here. So uh, there are multiple ways that this formula is represented. And the big difference only comes from that negative sign, okay? So whether it's negative RH, which is the constant there, right? Or sometimes you just see it as RH, but these two are switched here, okay? Instead of final minus initial, it's initial minus final, and there's no negative. It all comes out to the same thing, okay? The formulas are all the same. Really remember that what I, what, if, if there's one thing I could impress upon you guys from this chapter, 
uh, well, not this chapter, I should say from this class also, it's think about what your formulas are telling you, right? Always stop to take a look at your units and what the formulas mean and the stuff that we have to plug into it. Otherwise, we're just plugging in numbers that doesn't mean anything then, right? Right, but here we're talking about the change between different energetic levels is related to a change in energy by a simple constant. That's all this is telling us. And if we have a change in energy, it's it, for me, I, it always makes sense that the final minus the initial, right? Where you end up minus where you begin, right? But like I said, just paying attention to the equation that you have, whether it's the negative or the ni minus nf, right? All these different uh, iterations of this, it all gets you to the same answer as long as you're thinking and paying attention about what you're doing, okay? So let's, let's think here for just a second. We need to calculate energy, okay, right? And the wavelength, all right, so these are two separate things, sort of, right? So first of all, right, we can use this formula here to calculate energy, right? We can calculate the change in energy for that. And then we're gonna have to come back and take that value of energy to calculate wavelength. So we're gonna have to do two steps here, okay? Well, we're gonna have to do two big steps, I should say. But that's not a big shocker. The, equation, the, the problem kind of asks you to do that anyway. It's just calculate energy and wavelength, right? Those are two separate things that we're gonna have to take care of. We're going from n equal four to n equal two. So we start out initially at n equal four and we end up at n equal two. So if we just back up for one slide, then we know that this has to be an emission of energy, right? So this has to be an emission of energy. So really quickly, right? So really quickly, right? If we know we're doing an emission, we're going down in N and our delta E has to be less than zero, right? We're losing energy if you want to think about it in that way, right? All right. And if we're losing energy, we, it gets lost and emitted as a wavelength of light. It gets lost and emitted as a photon, right? So just be, just try and think about what's happening here, right? Electrons at the edge of a cliff, right? It falls off the cliff, right? And it releases energy as it does that. And it releases energy in the form of visible light. So this is also something that's kind of useful to think about. If you notice that the transition gets to N equal two, then this should be in the visible spectrum, okay? We should be emitting some light that we can actually see. And remember, our visible spectrum is between 400 and 700 nanometers, give or take, right? So we know that our, that our answer here in wavelength should be between 400 and 700 nanometers, okay? So we already have a pretty narrow idea about where our answer should be. But we're gonna have to start by doing some math here, all right? So if, you're done listening to my voice already, which I don't blame you. <laughs> it's early in the morning, right? When, and uh, maybe, you know, maybe this is the first thing I hope you guys are doing when you wake up today, right? So that we stay on pace with what we need to, right? So this, this stuff will show up on the next uh, quiz and exam and all these kind of things, right? So I hope, hopefully you guys aren't skipping this. Although I guess I'm talking to a video and if you guys are skipping the video, you won't see this anyway, right? So anyway. But um, we're gonna have to do a couple steps, and so now'd be a good time to pause and see what you guys can come up with, right? See if you guys can figure out the energy using that equation there, and see if you guys can figure out wavelength, remembering what a relationship between energy and wavelength is, okay? So I gotta step over here. Uh, I think I'm off screen at this point, but you guys should still be able to hear my voice, so that's all good. So let's get this going here, all right? So we have the change in, oh, I did it again, right? So we have the change in energy, right? Negative constant, one over um, n final, right? Squared minus one over n initial squared, okay? And so if we just plug in our numbers, our constant here, right? Our constant here is, uh, uh, 2.179 times 10 to the negative 18th joules, right? So negative Rydberg constant there. Final, right? We end up at the uh, n equal 2 level, okay? 
squared minus what we started out with, the n equal 4 level, squared. Okay? So the first part of this, we're just going to figure out energy. We're just plugging in the values that we have, right? So we n final was 2 and initial was 4. Okay? So we put this all together, and I get my change in energy is equal to negative 4.086 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Which makes sense, okay? So the energy for the atom, right? The energy for the atom goes down. It has to go down, right? Because we're staking a step down with what it is. So we should get a negative value for that. Cool. Now we have to think about what this means. So remember, if we take a step down in energy, right, a photon gets admitted. Now a photon can't have a negative energy because then we would end up with like a negative wavelength or a wavelength that just doesn't make sense, okay? Something absolutely, something really odd, okay? So the energy of our system, if you want to think about that, goes down. The energy of the photon is the opposite of this. If I am an atom and I sit down, right, if I decrease in energy, what, what leaves me has to be the exact opposite of this. Garbage in, garbage out, right? There has to be a balance in all of these things. This is exactly what we've been talking about in chapter five, okay? So the energy of our photon that gets emitted is the opposite of this. Okay, and there's a really good kind of uh, maybe a more wordy explanation of this in the textbook where it talks about the relationship of the energy versus the energy of the photon there, right? But if you just think about this, that energy that gets emitted has to go somewhere, okay? It, can, it doesn't just dissipate into the universe and a nothingness, right? That'd be a violation of the rules, okay? So the, it, it gets emitted as a photon, which will end up being visible light, and so it's gonna be the exact opposite of this here, right? So when I say the energy of the uh, photon, so we'll just call it energy of the photon here, is equal to 4.086 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, okay? And that has to make sense Right? That has to make sense because we are getting, we're emitted, and so that has to be a positive value for that, okay? Now we have to go back and think about our other equations. So previously, we had this equation here where energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency. And we know, and we know that the speed of light is equal to um, wavelength times frequency, okay? Now that we have a value for energy, remember the second part of this question said, what's the wavelength that gets emitted with this? So now that we have energy, we need to figure out a relationship between energy and wavelength, okay? And so we're gonna use these two equations here, or the combined equations also. We talked about that on, a previous, uh, on one of our previous slides also, okay? So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna use these two equations to figure out wavelength. So again, if you guys are just coming back, take a quick pause here, see if you guys can work it on your own, or if you guys are already beating me to it, that's even, even better, okay? So let's rearrange this equation here. So frequency is equal to um, our uh, energy over Planck's constant. So I'm gonna take the energy of my photon here. So 4.086, times 10 to the negative 19 joules, okay? Planck's constant is a constant, right? 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds, okay? And um, if I do this math, I got 6.166 times 10 to the 14th uh, per second, right? So I'll say per seconds right there, okay? So let me pause here for just a second to let you guys catch up or to think, uh, think through what we're talking about here, right? This is in units of joules. This is in units of joule seconds. So joules over joules cancel. We're left in units of per seconds, right? How frequent does something happen, right? So that's what 
uh, uh, frequency is. So we could call this hertz also. Either way is fine, okay? I just prefer to leave it as per second, whatever you guys want to do with this, okay? So let me pause here real quick and give you guys a I see this happen every semester type thing, okay? Oh, oh good, I got a shirt on today with pockets in there, always my favorite, all right? So um, one problem that I run into, that, that I see quite frequently is you guys set up the math properly, but then your when you put it into your calculators, that's not, it's not read properly. So be careful, make sure you put parentheses around these things. What I sometimes see students do is they type in Four, you know, 4.086 times 10 to the negative 19th, and then they just put a divided by this down here. And then it thinks that the, the, the exponent is supposed to be divided, and they get some random massive number out of this, right? They get some wrong answer. So make sure that when you guys are putting in the, uh, the appropriate uh, uh, powers here, make sure that you guys use uh, parentheses properly to express that, okay? So it's, it, it happens literally every semester. It doesn't matter what calculator I really see. There's no connection that I see in between that. So just be very careful how you guys enter this. And again, at the end of the day, always make sure you're thinking about does my answer make sense, right? That should be, that should be um, uh, step one, right? If we have something times 10 to the 19th over times 10 to the 34th, we should get some massive number over here, right? So uh, that's kind of what I mean by think about our answer, right? Looks like we're good to go. All right. So now that we have our frequency, okay? Now that we have our frequency, we can take our second equation here. Uh, let me change colors. So we can take our second equation here and solve for wavelength. So I'm going to rearrange the equation, right? So wavelength is equal to the speed of light over frequency. Speed of light is a constant, right? So uh, 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second over the value of, uh, over the frequency we just got, 6.166 times 10 to the 14th per second, right? And just for you, uh, for you guys at home, right? Per seconds and per seconds cancels out. Good stuff. We're left in units of meters, which is somewhat appropriate for wavelength. Okay. And if I do this, I got 4.862 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Okay. And if you recall. We had to, uh, the question asks us to calculate in units of nanometers, right? So nanometers is 10 to the ninth, right? There's 10 to the, there's 10 to the ninth nanometers in one meter. So we could do our conversion here, right? Of, na of meters into nanometers. And our answer would then be uh, 486, right? 486.2. All right, cool. So a couple of points about a, a, a problem like this, right? Thinking about whether you have an emission or absorption, what does that tell you about delta E? Is it positive, is it negative? What about the photon, right? These kind of things. If I fall down to my N equal two level, then I better get an answer that's in the visible spectrum, right? Visible spectrum is about 400 to 700. So right here, we're about 486. Uh, it sounds, it's probably seems like that's, I don't know, green or something like that, maybe, right? Uh, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe blue, I don't, I'm not 100% sure, I don't remember that actually, right? But this is between 400 and 700, so it looks like we've got a good value there. Okay, paying attention to your units, what cancels out, right? Um, knowing that your constants are just a constant. You could use a different value here for the speed of light, right? You don't have to do this exact one, 2.9 or even 3.0 times 10 to the eighth. That'd be just fine too, right? I will give you guys those constants, okay? So don't, don't worry about that stuff there, right? The other tricky part about this, just remembering what each one of these variables tells you, right? What is, 
What is frequency and what's its symbol? What is energy and what are the units associated with it? What's the speed of light and right? So paying attention to the units and your values that come that go along with that, extremely important, okay? Okie dokie. So now we're gonna take this idea of the different energy levels and now that we know everything there is about the energy level of a hydrogen atom, we're gonna see that it doesn't help us all that much. <laughs> so, but what I mean with this is, um, things get very complex as soon as we step away from a hydrogen atom. And uh, what I mean is, if you think about it, hydrogen's as simple as you can get. One proton, one electron. One thing positive, one thing negative, and that's all we have to deal with. But as soon as I put in another proton and I add another electron, then the electrons start to repel each other and uh, we start to get complex very, very, very quickly, okay? So that's all we're talking about here. Bohr's model predicts a hydrogen atom very well, right? Very, very well. In fact, so well that we could even do an experiment like this in, uh, in lab with you guys, right? It's fantastic. Amazing, right? Electrons do not move in fixed orbits, right? And that's what we're going to have to think about also, all right? So there's this older model that I think we've probably all seen where uh, we think about electrons living in fixed orbits, much like our solar system, where the nucleus is the sun, and like, much like the planets orbit around in fixed orbits around the sun, we think that our electrons will work that way also, but it's not really true, okay? And so uh, the next couple of slides here, I'm gonna stay off screen for just a little bit as we kind of zip through this here. Um, but de Broglie came in, in, in 1924 and it had this idea of all objects are moving as waves. Extremely interesting idea, very, um, let's say, contemporaneous with what's even being discovered or what's even being thought of now. And it talks about how they, how they figured this out and the wavelengths that are associated with this, and, and that's fine. And then something that uh, you know, we might have all heard of before, the Heisenberg uncertainty principles, and, and what does that affect with us, and why haven't we been able to image an individual atom and electrons and all that kind of stuff. So let, I'll just pause here for just a second. And um, I think this is always kind of interesting to take a moment with. So remember, we can only see things, right? We can only see things with a wavelength that's less than the object size, okay? So if I wanted to see an electron, I would have to get a really, 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 really small wavelength. Now we could do that, right? We could get wavelengths that are smaller than the size of an electron. But if we have a very, very um, um, short wavelength, we have high energy. And so then we're smacking an atom with that high energy, which is immediately gonna cause something to happen. And so then we don't know where the electron is. That's what we're talking about with this, uh, that's what we're talking about with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in this context, okay? We can't see electrons individually, okay? So as much as we talk about them here, right, we still haven't seen one in this way. Um, along came, comes our buddy Schrodinger, famous for his cats, and is often misquoted, I guess, or misunderstood cats, I should say, right? But at the end of the day, right? At the end of the day, what uh, Schrodinger is going to be contributing to us, at least, is this idea of a wave function, right? Now, this slide has six, five, five bullet points. Um, this slide right here is usually translated into an entire semester, if not more, of, an in, of a separate course, right, called quantum mechanics. Um, obviously, we're not gonna go through all that here. We're going to drastically simplify this idea of uh, wave function here uh, and apply it specifically to uh, how we can build an atom with it, okay? But we can actually calculate wave functions. Now, I don't know how to do it, I'll be honest, okay? <laughs> the math behind some of these are extremely complex, but it's a good thing that we have these things called computers, which do calculations, fantastic, uh, fantastic calculations for us. 
And, but that's a different topic that uh, we can talk about uh, maybe on an individual basis there. And we can show how, the, uh, how our computers can actually calculate these things for us. You guys could even do it at home if you guys wanted to. They're not that hard to set up actually, okay? Now our wave functions are gonna tell us about our orbitals, okay? They're gonna tell us about the orbitals, which is where our electrons are going to live, okay? Now this next topic we're about to get into is very conceptual, okay? It's very conceptual. And so we're gonna take a step away from the mathematical world here and just kind of use our brains here for a while in a different way, right? Not writing down an equation, but thinking about what things mean. So up at the top left-hand side there, that little pitchfork symbol, that's our uh, symbol for a wave function. And a wave function is literally what it sounds like. It's a function that you can graph out uh, that looks like a wave, okay? Now, hopefully you understand that I'm, it's, well, anyway, we'll, we'll, we, we can talk about that at a different time too, right? But if we square that, uh, uh, if we square that function, then all values of that function become positive, right? All values of that function become positive, right? And so then it becomes a probability, okay? And that's what we can deal with. We can say the probability of where an electron exists. Remember, we can't see it, right? But we can we can say with a certain certainty that the electron exists at this region, at this point, or some, excuse me, not at this point. It can exist within this region, okay? And when we graph that region, okay, when we graph that probability, it gives us unique shapes. And those unique shapes are what we call the orbitals, okay? So all I'm gonna show you here are mathematical functions visually. So if I gave you guys these equations, you could plug them into a graphing calculator and you could start to see these shapes kind of manifest themselves also, right? They're just discrete uh, points of probability, right? They are mathematically solvable equations, okay? All right, so what can we get out of this, right? So here's kind of our summary for what we're trying to say. Each atom wave function is called an orbital. The electrons don't follow fixed orbitals, they just exist within a region is what it is, okay? Boundary surfaces is another term for these. I'm just gonna call them orbitals, but just understand these are mathematical prob probability regions. That's all it really is, okay? So that's what we're gonna be dealing with here, all right? All right. So I wanna to talk to you guys about quantum numbers. And so I like that um, I could record this for you guys because this is one of these topics that you, you're gonna to have to come back and think about this more, work some problems, read through it, whatever it is, right? Because this is highly conceptual, okay? Let me, let me paint you a picture before we get into uh, the discussion for this. So what our goal is with a quantum number is to figure out exactly, as best we can, where an electron is living, okay? And we can think about this like a street address. So if I wanted to mail you a, uh, um, your diploma, right? If I wanted to mail you your diploma, I would need four bits of information. I would need your street number, I would need your street name, I would need the city you live in, and I would need your zip code. Right? And if I have those four bits of information, then I could figure out exactly where you are and deliver something to you, okay? So four bits of information, your street number, your street name, the city you live in, and the zip code, all right? So we need four bits of information to figure out where you live. We're gonna figure out four bits of information to figure out where electrons live. Those are principal quantum numbers. The principal quantum numbers just fall out of mathematical equations. They're gonna have discrete solutions for us, okay? The principal quantum number, we'll call that a lowercase n. Now, um, this is where it, it, it uh, starts to get tricky again because we're talking about different values of n and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but for the moment, just think about n as defining the uh, energetic level, okay? The energetic level of what we're going to be dealing with, okay? So the most, it's most important in determining the orbital energy, okay? You guys probably figured out that it's pretty darn important because it has the word principle in there, okay? Now, in just a little bit, 
I'm going to show you how on the periodic table we can figure out what n is. Okay, so this is where I'm building up with this. We're gonna, I'm going to give you guys your street address, right? And then we're going to put that onto a map, and our map is our periodic table, okay? So I'm going to show you on the periodic table where we can figure out n and all this kind of stuff. So if I lose you along the way, we can focus ourselves back on that periodic table there when we get to it, okay? But this can be determined for orbital energy. It defines the size, okay? Now, in just a minute, we're gonna learn about shapes. The bigger the N, the bigger that shape gets. So, if I have a sphere at N equal one, it has a certain size. As I go to N equal two, that sphere gets bigger. The shape doesn't change, okay? N doesn't change the shape, uh, excuse me, doesn't change the shape, okay? It just changes the size of the shape, right? Uh, orbitals with equal n are in the same shell, okay? So when I ask you guys how many orbitals are in this shell, then that's what you guys would be talking about, right? Shell and subshell is gonna be a term we'll see also, okay? But n, principal quantum number, any value from one to infinity, okay? Any value from one to infinity. All right. The next quantum number is L. Now, what's important is the limits of L, and that's up there in our blue square. L is anything from zero to n minus one, okay? From zero to n minus one. Extremely important that you guys remember the limits of these quantum numbers, okay? From L to n minus one. So what we'll see is that n sets the definition for all the other quantum numbers. It's almost as if it's a principal quantum number. Okay. What does L tell us? So L defines the shape. Okay. So remember, I just said that if you know n defines the size, L defines the shape. Okay. And there's really only four shapes that we're going to care about, and really there's only three. All right. So if L equals zero, okay, there's L can always equal zero. Okay. L can always equal zero. Right? So we're always at least going to have L equals zero. If L equals zero, then we have what's called an S orbital. And an S orbital has a spherical shape, okay? There we go. If L equal one, we have a P orbital. And P orbitals always have this shape, although what you'll see is that there are three P orbitals. They have the same shape, but they're oriented differently on the Cartesian coordinates here, okay? We have the px, the py, and the pz. Now, I know you guys can't see that on this recording, okay? So pull my slides and take a look at what I'm talking about, right? But we have our orbitals oriented along the principal axes. A px orbital is a p orbital along the x-axis. A py orbital is a p orbital oriented along the y. Okay, so we have px, py, and pz. So for every l equal one, we say we have p orbitals and we have three p orbitals, the px, the py, and the pz. Okay. L equal two are d orbitals. And again, we've got um, a couple of different ones here. You'll notice that we have four that are the same shape, but oriented different. And then we've got an odd screwball over here, okay? Now, x squared minus y squared, xy, yz, xz, and z squared. I don't need you guys to know those, okay? I don't need you guys to know those. What is important is that you'll notice we have five orbitals here in our d subshell, okay? If L equals three, then we have F, we would have seven orbitals there. If we had L equal four, we'd have G and we'd have nine, okay? So we start to see a pattern emerge for how many orbitals come out of each subshell, okay? But what's important for us to recognize here? That, first of all, L is our quantum number that tells us our shape, and we have to, have, we have to know our limits for L. L equals zero, two, n minus one. That means any value can exist. Here's what I mean. Let's say that uh, I give you a problem and I tell you that n equals um, two. Yeah, let's do, yeah. 
and do n equal to. Okay? So I define my principal quantum number as 2. That means L can be equal to 0 or 1. Okay? This is important. I didn't say that L is only equal to n minus 1. Right? That's not what I said. I said L equals 0 to n minus 1. So if I define as n equal 2, then my answers for L are 0 and 1 which means I have s orbitals and p orbitals, okay? Rewind this 30 seconds or a minute here if you don't quite catch that, right? L is zero to n minus one, multiple answers, okay. The next quantum number is M sub L. Blue box up the top there, okay? M sub L is limited by L, so the answers for M sub L are negative L to positive L. Again, take a note, I didn't say the answer is negative L and positive L, I said negative L to positive L. Now, what we're going to do or how we're going to use this, uh, we're, this is going to tell us um, how many orbitals exist at each subshell. I'll give you an example in just a second, okay? But if you back up for just a second on the previous slide, we said that if L equal 1, if L equal 1, we have p orbitals, and I told you there's three p orbitals. Well, how do we know this? Well, that's what M sub L tells us. It tells us it defines the orientation of the orbital. Fair enough. Back up and say, remember we have Px, Py, and Pz, okay? So M sub L defines which one of those orientations we have, either along the x, the y, or the z, okay? So watch, right? If n equal three and L equal two. I'm not saying only two. I'm just, I'm, we have to define what L is to be able to solve M sub L, right? If L equal two, that means I'm dealing with the three D orbital. Now pause here for just a second, okay? Pause here for just a second. This first part is extremely important, okay? How am I figuring this out? If L equal two, that tells me I've got a D orbital, okay? If n equal three, that tells me it's the three orbital, or excuse me, the principal uh, quantum number there of three, okay? I have a 3d orbital set, okay? I need my n, I need my, uh, I need my l. If I'm with my 3d orbitals, my m sub l can equal negative two, negative one, zero, one, or two. How did I get that? M sub L is defined by, or excuse me, is limited by L from negative L to positive L at whole integer numbers. So I start at negative two, negative one, zero, one. Now, these numbers don't really matter. It doesn't matter that it's negative two or negative one or zero, one. It matters how many numbers I have. Okay? Follow with me again here. The actual answers don't really matter. It's how many answers. I have one, two, three, four, five answers. If I have five answers, I have five orbitals. Well, I don't believe you, Dr. H, that's fine. Okay, let's back up the slide for just a second. Here's my D orbital set. How many orbitals are there? Well, there's five, okay? And you guys could go through and do this exact same thing here, right, for all these other orbital sets. For my 3p, n equals 3, l equals 1, m sub l can be minus 1, 0, or 1. Who cares about those numbers? What I care about is how many numbers I have. There's three numbers, so I have three of my p orbitals, okay? That's all we're talking about with this. If l equals 0, then m sub l has to be equal to zero. We have one s orbital, okay? So every combination of n, l, and m sub l has a different shape and or orientation. That's gonna be important also, okay?
All right, one last quantum number here to deal with, everyone's favorite because it's the easiest. We call this the spin quantum number, M sub S. M sub S only has two possible answers, plus one half, minus one half. So remember, or uh, if it wasn't clear, what we're doing is figuring out where these electrons live in these orbitals, right? Or where these, uh, or what is living in these orbitals. And so we have to give four values for that electron that's living in there. And electrons can either spin in either up or down, and we just call that plus one half or minus one half, okay? There's no limits for this. We don't have to worry about the other things. M sub S is only plus one half or minus one half, okay? Now, now that we understand 100% of all of our quantum numbers, right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start to use those values to fill in where electrons are around atoms, and we're gonna use that to figure out the arrangement of the periodic table also. We're gonna kind of relate these two ideas together, okay? But one important thing to recognize is that every electron in an atom must have a unique answer for each one of these, okay? Just like if we go back to how we started this uh, discussion, you live at a specific address, you have a specific name, there's nobody else in this universe, right, that lives at that address with that name. It's unique to you, okay? It's unique to you. And so that's the same thing here for each electron. Each electron has to have its own set of answers mathematically to be able to describe it, okay? The other very important bit of information is there can only be two electrons per orbital, not per subshell, okay? Per orbital. So if I have five d orbitals, then two electrons can live in each one of those five orbitals. And that's gonna be important also, okay? So two very important bits of information coming right at the end of a very dense set of uh, notes right here, okay? So I think this is a good place to kind of pause. Um, this is kind of all of the, let's say, answers right here, so to speak. Uh, I always, discourage you guys from memorizing stuff. I don't want to memorize all these numbers. What I would rather do is understand all these here, okay? But this will be a good place for us to pick up, um, and we will see if we're back on Wednesday here. If not, we'll uh, continue this, and we'll see if we continue to work in this format or whatever we might be able to do. But um, I'll be around. Uh, I can set up uh, Teams uh, office hours with you guys if you guys need help with things. And uh, we'll see. We'll see how things go. Okay. All right. I will see you guys next time.